Hello, Endeavor here. It goes without saying that today, Hollywood and the mainstream culture as a whole has gone stale. It seems these days we're subjected to an endless stream of big budget yet shallow sequels and remakes, laced with progressive political messaging that's about as subtle as a sledgehammer. And I'd say the biggest culprit of the hollowing out of Hollywood is Disney. You can watch hundreds of hours of reviews of their recent Star Wars trilogy just to get an idea of the bad taste Disney has left in everyone's mouths. But it hasn't always been like that. You don't have to look too far back at all to realize that Disney occasionally delivered thoughtful stories, many of which actually had some valuable insights on the modern world. One of these films is the 2008 hit WALL-E. WALL-E was directed by Andrew Stanton and told the story of a robot whose job it was to pick up humanity's trash. It was massively successful both critically and at the box office. WALL-E won tons of awards and is considered to be one of Disney's best films. I recently saw WALL-E again, which I hadn't seen for years, and I found some really fascinating and surprising themes in the story. So for this video, I'm going to take a look at WALL-E through a neo-reactionary lens and see if there really are any hidden red pills in Disney's 2008 film. So the film takes place in the 29th century. Earth has been turned into a gigantic garbage heap. It's uninhabitable and has been abandoned by humanity who have left for outer space. Wally is a small garbage disposal robot who has been left behind to clean up the endless piles of trash that now cover the planet. As he sorts through the garbage, Wally collects various items which he finds interesting. One of these is a small green plant which he finds growing under one of the piles of garbage. He puts it in a shoe and brings it back to his little shed where he lives. He's entirely alone until a female robot named Eve lands on Earth one day who Wally falls in love with. In an attempt to win her over, he gives her some of the various items which she has saved. When he shows Eve the plant, she shuts down and sends off a beacon to a spacecraft which brought her to Earth. Wally is distraught, not knowing what happened to Eve, and he boards the ship which takes her away in an attempt to reactivate her. The spacecraft brings them to a mothership called the Axiom, which is where humanity now lives. And we finally get to see the state in which humanity now exists. The humans have unlimited material comfort. They've been turned into these overweight blobs with technology providing them endless stimulation. Technology has completely replaced their need for human agency to the extent that they don't even need to walk anymore. It's revealed that Eve was a probe sent to Earth in search of living vegetation. Captain McRae, the commander of the Axiom, is surprised to hear that Eve has come back positive, something which has never happened before. The captain's job is almost entirely automated too, with his robotic lieutenant named Otto doing almost all the work for him. But the news of the positive probe is kind of a break in the system for him. McRae learns that the ship's designers had a plan to return to Earth once living vegetation was discovered and Earth was again inhabitable so humanity could recolonize the planet. By inserting the plant into the ship's hollow detector, the Axiom will be sent into hyperdrive back to Earth. Meanwhile, Wally goes to rescue Eve and is identified as a foreign element by the Starliner's automated security system. The robots remove the plant from Eve in an attempt to prevent the captain from getting his hands on it. He later discovers that the plan to return to Earth was scrapped because previous generations had incorrectly thought that the planet was unsalvageable. Hence, the robots try to prevent the captain from fulfilling the return to Earth. Wally frees Eve and they bring the plant to McRae, who is dead set on returning to Earth. Otto mutinies and tries to prevent the captain from sending the ship back. After a struggle, McRae is able to shut down Otto, which breaks the humans out of their pacification by the robots. Wally is able to place the plant in the hollow detector, sending the ship back to Earth. The film ends with the humans disembarking from the Axiom to on a completely desolate Earth. With the assistance of the robots, they begin planting new vegetation as the first step to recolonizing the planet. So what are some themes we see in WALL-E, and what insight do they provide on the modern world? Well, the two most obvious themes in WALL-E are consumerism and environmentalism. The natural environment of the planet has been completely destroyed by a humanity possessed by the drive for capitalistic consumption. These are often considered left-wing themes, but below the surface, this really isn't the case in the film WALL-E. The consumeristic society that's portrayed in the film as having destroyed the planet is capitalist. It was a mega corporation called By and Large, by spelled B-U-I, that built the Starliner which evacuated humanity from Earth and designed a system which facilitates maximum consumption. So, is Wally a socialist film or even a Marxist film? No, 
The socialist critique of capitalism is that it creates inequality, that it keeps the masses poor and a small capital-owning class rich. The ambition of Marxism is to overthrow the capitalist class and to claim common ownership of the means of production by the masses. Marxism envisions a classless society that would put an end to human want and need. But if Wally was a Marxist film, you'd probably see a poor underclass who are oppressed by the endless consumption of the humans. They'd probably have a different skin color from the humans so that it could also be an allegory for racism and the humans would treat them badly just for the sake of it, and the film would probably conclude with the underclass overthrowing the humans. But we don't see that in the film. What we see instead is a world in which capitalism has succeeded in giving all of mankind endless material wealth and comfort. Human want and need has been completely overcome. They're just left with infinite time for leisure. So in such a world, socialism would be completely unnecessary. There would be no need for a Marxist revolution because all of its materialistic goals would have already been fulfilled. Even the intersectional left of the present day wouldn't have much to complain about in such a world. Because we see that, other than the position of the captain, it doesn't really appear that hierarchy really exists on the axiom. So the entire ideology of intersectionality would be irrelevant because there isn't really any inequality between different social groups. Everyone is able to share equally in the surpluses of capitalism. Instead, the world portrayed in Wally is not one where capitalism keeps people poor, but instead it has succeeded in doing everything it was intended to, and that's the problem. So if it is a critique of capitalism, it's a critique from the right. The consumerism brought about by infinite prosperity has left the humans jaded. There's a scene in the movie where one human asks another if he wants to go to the virtual driving range, to which he answers no. His friend asks him then what does he want to do, to which he just replies by saying something. They have endless leisure at their disposal, but they're bored by the emptiness of it all. Secondly, environmentalism is usually considered to be a left-wing theme, but that's not the case in Wally -E either. Left-wing politics are almost always based on a materialistic understanding of the world. So, left-wing environmentalism often justifies itself through concerns over the impact industry has on humans. Take the climate change agenda, for example. The narrative we're being fed is that it will either destroy the planet in a number of years or make life worse for everyone in the third world. And last year we started to see words like climate refugee entering the discourse. Just a side note, I don't deny the existence of climate change, but I certainly oppose the more sinister agenda it's being used to justify. But the point is that left-wing politics only really justifies environmentalism in material terms. But what we see in Wally -E is that the destruction of the environment hasn't negatively impacted the material wealth of humanity. Humans are materially as comfortable as can be, and the price that they paid for it was the environment of the natural world. So under purely utilitarian terms, you can't justify why the destruction of the environment was a negative thing. Yet the film portrays it clearly as a negative occurrence. In order to do so, you'd have to believe that the environment itself is something intrinsically valuable beyond the material. And I'll get into later what the film portrays the real value of the environment as. What you see at the start of the film is that Earth has been reduced to one big pile of trash. Wally -E finds a living insect which he makes his pet because it's the only living animal he has ever seen on the planet. He also finds a small living plant, which of course is important to the plot of the film. What this speaks to is the inherent value of life, that even the most basic life form has some value. The insect and the plant stand out from the rest of the planet on the basic fact that they are living. Another theme that the film delves into is how consumerism attempts to commodify identity. When Wally -E first enters the Axiom, all the humans are wearing red. An advertisement comes on which says, try blue, it's the new red. All the humans see the ad and press a button which just instantly changes their clothes from red to blue. The humans in Wally -E are the equivalent of the bug man today, whose entire being is defined by the products he consumes. For the bug man, being a Star Wars or Marvel fan is fundamental to his sense of identity. But they can only really express this through watching films and buying merchandise. The same could be said for someone with an unhealthy obsession with professional sports or someone who defines themselves by the genre of music they listen to. One consumer identifies as a Manchester United fan, one as a Star Wars fan, one as a punk music fan. This all gives the false perception of individuality because all these identities are fundamentally determined by consumer products. 
When you zoom out, you see interchangeable economic units completely at the mercy of big corporations. And the film Wally illustrates this by reducing it to the absolute simplest form. By having a corporation just say, wear blue, and everyone starts wearing blue as if it's a genuine expression of individuality. One of the lines in the movie that I found fascinating is when the captain unenthusiastically announces to the entire ship that it's the 700th anniversary of their five-year cruise, and that their forefathers would be proud that they were doing the exact same thing centuries later. The humans have reached what's referred to as the end of history. The end of history is a concept which predicts that humanity will reach an end point of socio-political development and continue into the future without any major changes. Several thinkers have predicted this in the past. Karl Marx believed that the establishment of a classless communist society would bring about the end of history because it would put an end to class struggle, which he saw as the driving force behind history. He believed that history would end because humanity's material needs and wants would be satisfied, which, as I mentioned earlier, is the case for humanity in the film. But I'd say the end of history portrayed in Wally is more similar to the prediction of Francis Fukuyama. At the end of the Cold War, Fukuyama argued that, rather than communism, liberal democracy and free market capitalism was the pinnacle of human socio-political development. And through the spread of liberalism and capitalism to the entire world, the end of history would be achieved. Though Fukuyama envisioned the end of history a lot less utopian than Marx did, there are similarities. Both classic liberal and leftist thinkers have seen the end of history as this ultimate good that humanity should at least try to achieve. But in the film Wally, -E, the end of history has been achieved. Humans have been living under unchanged socio-political structures for centuries. But rather than a utopia, it's a nihilistic, depressing hell. Because the end of history has killed the human spirit. It has robbed their lives of all meaning. Which is why Captain McRae's decision to return to Earth is not motivated by material gain, but a desire to reach new levels of human ambition. We also see him using the Axiom's database to learn about how humanity lived on Earth when it was there. He first learns about vegetation and farming, and eventually reaches things like culture. His motivation for returning to Earth is to restore a more authentic way of life. And that can only be done on Earth because it's their natural habitat. For example, he learns about dancing and asks the database what a hoedown is. On Earth, Wally had found a VHS of the 1960s film Hello Dolly, which he showed to Eve. She plays back the recording for the captain and shows him the song Put On Your Sunday Clothes from the film. I'd imagine that the axiom had music of some kind, but what sets this apart for the captain is that he sees it as a more soulful human expression. I doubt that would work with music from someone like Ariana Grande or Jay-Z or some modern crap like that. There's also a scene where Wally inadvertently shuts down a woman's screen and snaps her out of the system. It makes her clothes turn from blue back to red. She snaps a man out of the system, and where they actually begin to interact with each other in a more authentic manner. We see the humans communicating through technology, which I guess is their version of social media, but none of them have any real genuine relationships with each other. I'll admit, this actually made me wonder how humans in this world would reproduce, since we see children on the ship, so they do exist. Obviously, they can't really address this because it's a kid's film, but I'd imagine that sexuality in such a world would function something like the way Tinder does today. That you just set yourself to available and the system matches you with a partner whom you have no real relationship to. So sexuality would be commodified just like everything else. What we do see in the film is that the children are under the complete care of robots. Parents have no relationship to their kids or each other whatsoever, meaning the nuclear family doesn't exist in this world. The children are just processed into new consumer units. We see that their education that they receive is entirely focused on turning them into the perfect consumers, with them being taught brand loyalty to by and large, the company who owns the ship. The only villain we see in the film is Otto, the robotic lieutenant to Captain McRae. But he's just an AI designed to help the system run effectively. The real villain in the film is the system itself. It's designed to keep the humans trapped inside where they can endlessly consume. Under a liberal understanding of freedom, life aboard the Axiom is completely free. Humans are free to pursue any hedonistic desire at any moment with no inhibitions or consequences imposed on them for doing so. They can play virtual tennis or virtual golf as much as they want, eat whatever they want, and sleep whenever they want. 
The humans in Wally -E are living the ideal life according to liberalism. There are absolutely no barriers to their pursuit of gluttony. But what they're not free to do is to exit the system. When the man and the woman who are snapped out of the sedation begin to actually share a human experience with each other, the robots step in and try to put an end to it. Even something so minor is a threat to the system because a genuine human relationship provides value beyond consumption. At the climax of the film, when Captain McRae decides that humanity must return to Earth, Otto mutinies and the entire system tries to stop the captain, because it would put an end to the system of perpetual consumption. So the humans are quote-unquote free in a liberal sense that they have no inhibitions on their capacity to pursue self-indulgent pleasure. However, they are absolutely not free to pursue anything transcendental or life-affirming, and the system cracks down on them relentlessly for doing so. The humans are only truly freed once the system is destroyed. At the film's conclusion, when the humans return to Earth to recolonize the planet, the first thing they do is plant new vegetation, starting their first farms. Here, we see the intrinsic value that the environment has to humans. It's that the Earth's environment is an essential part of humanity's natural state of being. That seeing trees and flowers or walking across a grassy field is a genuine human experience that makes us feel at home as we are natives to this planet. So the film ends with the humans leaving the nihilistic status of perpetual consumption. But they haven't gone back either. They don't outright reject the technology, instead they put the technology at their disposal to a new use. Rather than simply using it for material comfort, they use it to help them embark on a new civilizational project. The recolonization of Earth and the rediscovery of a more authentic way of life. The end of history has ended and history has resumed. So, is Wally -E a reactionary movie? I would say, yes, it is. And today, Disney is a major architect of global homo with products like the Star Wars series or the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the latter of which I actually made a video about on my BitChute channel. Films which are entirely product and no art. They're just soulless entertainment that I'd imagine the humans in the film Wally -E would have wasted their time watching. There's a real irony to the fact that just over a decade ago, Disney produced a right-wing film which actually was a damning critique of the societal project that they themselves are advancing. And it was incredibly successful. Maybe it's because it spoke many truths to the issues of the modern world. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and follow me on Twitter. If you'd like to support my channel, you can on either Patreon or PayPal. And if you'd like to join my Discord community, you can do that too. All links are down below. Thank you for listening. Till next time, Endeavor.